welcome everybody to uh, the Q&A Cafe. In fact, I was just telling our guest host, John Donovan, that this is probably the 300th and something Q&A. It's our season finale for right now. And when we resume in the fall, it'll be our 10th anniversary. So let's hear it for the Q&A Cafe. Yeah, yeah. Just have to figure out how to monetize it. But I see so many familiar faces here, not only as friends, but who have been coming to the Q&A Cafe from the beginning. So thank you very much. And um, this is our guest host, John Donvan of ABC News, and also a Georgetowner and a friend. And I talked him into this gig, which I think he's going to enjoy when we were judging a dog show together. That's right. So that's how we roll in yeah. Georgetown, isn't yeah. it? <laughs> so, um, uh, I'm all yours, John. All right. Well, it's, um, as you know, I read the book in the winter. You did. And you I read was, a gallery. I, I sent you some nice emails about it. You did. Which makes it safe for me to be here. <laughs> you know, this isn't going to go wrong. Um, and, um, but I, I, I find it interesting that you've created this format because writing a memoir is almost an act of narcissism. Mm. But I guess your narcissism, the limit is interviewing yourself about your book up here. So you. You need me up here to do that. Yes, you're that actually part just a means you. to an end. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but I said, you know, there was no conversation between us no, about no, is, how we were going to do this. Worked out. Not in the least. Um, but I actually mentioned your book on Monday. I was having coffee with uh, Ted Koppel, my old boss and colleague. My old boss. And as often happens with Ted, the talk turned to the topic of books that he was reading, and he was. He's going through a series of books that, uh, that focus on the period leading up to the First World War, and the conversation got very serious. Then he asked me, what have you been reading? And so I, <laughs> so I, I didn't want to tell him I was reading a book that had flowers on the cover. <laughs> it's safe for me. But I, 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 I did, in fact, tell him that uh, you've written a book. He wishes you uh, you're the best with it. Yeah. But I also told him, you know, Ted, I would actually read it. It's, n it's not just some chick book. It's, it's actually, not a chick it book. gets into some very, very interesting stuff. So I think I convinced him. Good. And, I'd uh, love for Ted to read it. Yeah. So Because I think I, I don't recall, but I even think I made reference in there in, in one draft. You know, when you're writing one of these things, you can't honestly remember what made it into the final book. But I do recall when I was doing Nightline, I was 40 years old, and it all of a sudden occurred to me, and I mentioned this to him, that I was never going to get pregnant working for him because I was getting off work at midnight and getting up at 8 a.m. so that I could be smart on the 11 a.m. conference call, and there went any hope right, <laughs> right. creating a family. And, uh, and I, I think I made mention that I had to leave Nightline to go get pregnant. And it worked. And, and, and people at Nightline totally get it. Yeah, no. You know, you tell a woman who works for Nightline that, and she goes, absolutely. Well, there are actually a lot of babies at Nightline these days. But, the, but, the, but, the, but it's changed. Yeah, the world has changed. It's yes. changed, because they yeah. pre-tape a lot, don't they? Yeah. Back when you were working there, we would ride horses to work every day. Yeah. It was, it was a different role. <laughs> yeah, but we were live all the time, yeah. and there was a conference call with Ted where you better get an A, or the professor would call you into his office later. So. Yes. Um, I digress. I've done quite a bit of marking up Good. of my copy of Innocent Spouse, available at bookstores near you. Yes, um, it is. And what I found interesting was a lot, but what I found interesting was that um, in really letting it all hang out, in, in actually doing a, a very uh, self-exposing memoir, um, yeah. you, 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 you let yourself not always seem uh, admirable. I wasn't. And, and the interesting area in which you let yourself not be seen admirable was in, the, in your willingness to kind of go along for the ride. It was a good ride. Yeah, how good was the ride? It was a great ride. And um, first, I didn't know that it wasn't real. I just thought magic carpets were Howard's line of work. And I, I didn't know to ask if we were really riding on air or living in a house of cards. Because he had grown up with money. He was comfortable with money. But not as much as you thought. Well, no. And, um, but there, there was clear, it was clear if you went to his family home or spent time with his parents, it was clear there was lots of money and it was solid, real right, money. Right. But Howard had a way of burning through even solid, real money. You say um, early on, uh, 
I was easily seduced by what was outside the box. Harold Joint was outside the box. He was a combination of Cary Grant and Jack Nicholson. So what's the, the Grant and Nicholson? And, and well, the Cary Grant was the glamorous, um, eloquent, elegant uh, character, witty, charming, just you kind of um, were enthralled to his charisma from the moment you met him. And when I mentioned Jack Nicholson, I was really thinking of The Shining. <laughs> <laughs> and that part of The Shining, because Howard could, uh, and, and as I make clear in the book, there, there were, there were uh, 10 years, the first 10 years of our marriage were like a rodeo ride, and he was the Bronco and I was riding it. And um, because, uh, we didn't know then that he suffered from chronic depression and it made for really interesting personality changes usually fueled by alcohol and howard could go on just incredible benders i mean they'd start out so it wasn't beautiful. it wasn't good jack nicholson it was bad jack nicholson. yeah no it's, it's the shining i mean it's yeah. the shining and it's uh, you know practically uh smashing through the door with an axe though that never happened but you, you, you write in the early pages about lots of time spent on sailboats and drinking Dom Perignon mm -hmm. and eating uh, Beluga caviar. There was that too. And um, I, was was a kid, I was a kid in the candy store of love. I was. Were you kind of needy? I mean, was, was he, yeah, was he oh, pushing some I, button that was not yeah, just uh, sure, any girl? Sure, because I, I had uh, uh, come out of high school uh, at 18, as most kids do. Yeah. And I went right into United Press International as um, a young reporter, incredibly young reporter, covering the streets, covering the, the anti-war movement. Was, this was 1968, and you, you looked left or right, and there was a story to cover. And if you were young and didn't mind tear gas, any major news organization in America would hire you. It was also a great news period. It was a great was, news yeah, period. Yeah. We had a war over there, and we had the protest movement here. And UPI just lapped me up. And I mean, I was filing stories on the A-Wire. It was, I was a worker. And you were 18? I was 18, wow. then 19, then 20. And then Time Magazine picked me up as a stringer. When I was 21, Time Magazine moved me to New York because they wanted a young person who could, who was fluent in the anti-war movement, but who had also covered politics. So, so where does Nina so come out of that, though? Well, I mean, because I didn't have, I had boyfriends and whatnot, but my life was just um, hard work, and in a lot of ways. Um, I'd grown up in a, in a very insecure household in that loving parents, wonderful parents, but we were always running off the rails. We were always in debt. Everything was always about to come apart. My parents were great. But so, but was, was, so, so was the, the need that Howard filled? Security. Okay, so it's, it, was about Security. His, it was about his wealth then. Oh, he seemed so stable to me. It's not, it wasn't just the money. He knew how to drive. He knew how to do things. He knew how to do things outside of my world. I knew how to do everything in my world. I lived at home in a, in a one-room apartment with shag carpeting with a cot from L.L. Bean and cardboard boxes for end tables. And um, I didn't really have food, and I just had a suitcase there, hoping that I'd get sent somewhere glamorous by, at the time I was working at NBC. And I met this man who had like not one car, but two cars, had not one house, but two houses and an apartment in New York. So the boyfriends that you were not getting this they zing were, with, what kind of stuff did they have? <laughs> they or were not wonderful, have? but my father called them all vagabonds. <laughs> Well, the one, there was one I was madly in love with before Howard who owned fishing boats in the Outer Banks and would disappear for periods of time and come back and he played polo and he flew small airplanes but I never got into them and he was a charismatic, daring, enchanting character. But there wasn't that sense of stability because oh. I never knew where it was coming from or when. You know, he'd just appear, he'd go. Uh, and Howard was just the, the picture of maturity. Even, even with his Jack Nicholson parts. And your 12-year age difference? 12-year age difference. You think difference. that was part of this? Uh, I'm sure that was part, but the man I'd been dating before was like 30 years old or so. I mean, oh, I don't okay. think. I see a pattern there. A little bit. Um, <laughs> Dr. Donovan. Yes, well. <laughs> I'm not trying to, I'm trying to help you here because you are on to something and I just want to articulate it well. Are you I afraid this, of where we're going? Yeah, but I think the simplest way to explain it is that my parents were fat. My mother was a Romanian gypsy. My father was a Scots-Irish kind of uh, fly boy. They met 
it, during World War II, they knew each other for two weeks. Manny, Mo, and Jack, the Pet Boys, introduced them, and they married a week later. And that was the that was the the nature of their um, marriage. Yeah. And they had these four kids and four kids. And and here we, you know, then it was always suburbia, and they never really fit in. And we were just always moving. So, so early in the story, though, as early as page thirteen, you say uh, that after you had been hanging out a while. He, then he told you that he was in the midst of a divorce. Yes. From his second wife. Right. So, so I'm guessing he hadn't told you he was married up till that point. No, or and it hadn't early? really been, it hadn't really come up because the, th the thing wasn't like that yet. Okay, so this was not a warning sign. Should not have been taken as some sort of warning sign about his... Uh, well, the way I heard it, mm -hmm. I'm getting a divorce. So, okay. not entirely fair game, but semi-fair game. So then you, you did mention that he had this... Standards were different then than they are now. He had sudden meltdowns. He became abusive and cruel. Mm -hmm. Out of the blue, he hit me. Mm -hmm. He locked me out of the house. Mm -hmm. He pushed me out of the car. Mm -hmm. um, and you stayed. There yeah. There's no question. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm um, my mother always said this about me. I was, you know, incredibly stubborn. I wouldn't stop until I achieved my goal, which was why I was good as a television producer. But I suppose for me, I knew this marriage was good, and I, I was just hell-bent on saving it. I figured that I thought at the time I was his third wife. I would find out later I was actually his fourth wife. But I just, here I, you know, you remember I'd given up my career. Mm -hmm. um, I was living with him out in Upperville, Virginia, in the middle of a 500-acre cow farm. Which you didn't love. You know, I liked it in theory. Yeah. I liked some of my friends. But it was, it, it was a thousand percent out of my wheelhouse because nobody worked. Mm -hmm. And I was so used to working and I didn't know what to do with myself. You know, we went to lunch and we ate well and we took trips and then he'd have these personality changes. But I had really become almost invisible. I mean, I had, I had basically a nervous breakdown. Because How many years was that? Upper a Valley? year and, well, we were out there mm, almost seven years. Well, but I, a year into it, I was in a closet with the door shut, not wanting to come out, you know. I was like, I was like, this was not, you know, I think marijuana got me through it, basically. <laughs> but I was growing my own, so it was very good. Well, you were, and, you were out there. Yeah, well, I've, I've always been good with, you know, Yeah, herbs. you said you said at this period, <laughs> you said two things that are interesting. I never once questioned our life of quiet luxury which you've already covered. But then three sentences later you say, I somehow felt like an orphan. Well, that's about love. Because I had, he was very jealous of um, everybody in my life before him. Mm -hmm. He really just wanted to keep me under a hat. Um, he, he was jealous of my friends, my, my rambunctious friends from before, and sort of quietly just sort of eased them out of my life. And I was very isolated. You know, we, we'd only see each other or my family and a few friends out there. So when, when things would go really bad, if he'd hit me, I just didn't feel like I had anybody I could go to. And that, that is the way many women feel in that situation. And it didn't happen often. There'd be huge chunks of time. It wasn't patterned behavior. It would just happen out of the blue. And then finally one day, I was just like, this is just so not me. I am just not going to put up with this. And I, and I was in having my annual physical, and I just brought it up with my doctor. I said, I, I, don't like what, I don't like the way things are going down at home. And he thought I should see a psychiatrist. And I did. And um, boy, that's a hard process at the beginning. I mean, having to go back over your whole life. But then it started, then it, at, at a certain point, it just started to work. It got traction. And I understood where he was going with me. And I started, um, I started sort of filling in. If, I, if I'd been empty on the inside and low self-esteem and not really, you know, you can be loaded with talent, but still have very low self-esteem. Yeah. And I think that was me. I'd achieved so much so young. I had all these symbols of enormous success. I mean, I'd, I'd been writing the CBS Evening News all through Watergate. We were winning Peabody Awards, Emmy Awards, DuPont Awards. We were the crown jewel of CBS News. Um, I'd gone off to the Caribbean for a year and crewed on a racing sailboat and then ended up in the south of France. And I come back and CBS puts me right back 
at work at the uh, Kansas City Convention, uh, the GOP convention, when uh, Ford got the nomination. You know, you can get very busy and feel like a success on the outside, but not feel it on the inside. What therapy did is it filled me in. It really made me strong and assertive, and what I call a woman in full, not to completely steal from Tom Wolfe, but a little bit. And, um, and you know what happened with Howard? He got jealous, oh. and he wanted the same thing. And he followed me into the same therapist. That's worrisome. Well, no, it was great because you know what happened? The therapist did the same work up on him uh -huh. and said, you know, you have all the signs of chronic depression. Okay, so, but this, this was not a marriage counselor. This was separate therapy. No, this therapy. was psych psychotherapy, yeah. classic psychotherapy. But he was, you weren't in the room together. Nope, not okay. in the room right. together. Yeah. He just wanted to go to the same great guy I was going to who was making me feel so good about life. And uh, the doctor discovered a couple of things. He discovered that he suffered from chronic depression. In the course of the workup to discover that he suffered from chronic depression, they discovered that he also had leukemia, which we didn't know. Not related, it was just interesting that this got found out at the same time, um, a stage zero leukemia. But the doctor put him on Prozac. And I'm not a shell for the um, um, pharmacy companies, but it was a it was a night and day transformation. So the medication changed him is really what you're saying. But the medication? I really find it interesting that if he went through this process of psychoanalysis where in, in theory... And you, that helped him a lot too. Well, what did he... Do you have any idea what he discovered about himself? That he really sense? hated his parents, but not really. Yeah. It was a, he had a very complicated... He had a complicated thing with his father. And that relationship with his father goes back to how he got in trouble at Nathan's. Mm -hmm. Because the, the thing about Nathan's, and I found this out really after he died, as, as my very capable lawyers sort of deconstructed the whole thing, is that um, Mr. Joint, a, a wonderful man, a patent lawyer, he patented things like stainless steel on the parking meter and took a piece of the action, so did very well. And his mother, May, uh, incredible collectors of 18th century American um, decorative arts, uh, you know, had been in Old Town Alexandria forever. Um, you know, Howard was bouncing around, living in all this wealth, hadn't really settled on anything. And uh, Mr. Joint one day said, um, you know, you seem to like, you need to work, you're 30, and you seem to like to spend a lot of time in bars. So maybe you should mm -hmm. work in a bar. So he bought him Nathan's. I mean, it's a little more complicated than that, but he basically bought him Nathan's. And he oversaw the writing of the lease and didn't really dot the I's and cross the T's quite, quite as strenuously as a serious businessman would have done with a lease yeah. like that. And, uh, and thus started, you know, Howard's career owning Nathan's. That would have been 1969. And amazing location, amazing time in the history of Georgetown and Washington. Across the street from Nathan's was a restaurant called um, The Reeve Gauche, which was quite the, the haute restaurant of the whole city, not just Georgetown, and uh, surrounded by limousines, all the, you know, the top names, all the bold facers were in there. Nathan's became like the waiting room for everybody waiting for their table at, at Reeve Gauche. And everybody came back to, from Reeve Gauche after dinner and danced in the back room until the wee hours. This was the golden hours. age. This was, like, this was a kind of, this was before cell phones, pagers, yeah. all of that. But Nathan's was never, it was always packed with people, but it, the business model didn't work. So, so, but how much did you not know? Well, what I didn't know is that Mr. Joint was always netting up the shortfall. Nathan's couldn't make rent, or Nathan's couldn't pay Coca-Cola, or Nathan's So what was the story you were getting from Howard? Everything was hunky-dory? Yeah, well, well, you know, I wasn't, believe me. I went to my work and did that, and he did his work, and I didn't come home and say, well, now tell me how business went down today at Nathan's. It was fine. I mean, it, nothing, there were never ripples, you know, if there, to the extent that there was a ripple, it wasn't that we were suddenly ever richer, it was that we were suddenly poorer, uh -huh. you know, and, 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 you know, we couldn't take a trip or we couldn't have a very large Christmas. And that would be because his father had, you know, but one, drawn one, a line in the sand. One of the ways in which, as I said, you, you, you portray an unflattering portrait of yourself, you, you give yourself quite a difficult ride in the book for having been so oblivious. 
Yeah. You you don't well, think. I was. But what's wrong? But but. I chose to be. Okay. What do you mean by that? Well, in that um, I loved being married, and I didn't want to come home and like have to do a t tutorial in bookkeeping. I loved that I married a man who was comfortable with numbers. So when our tax returns, he took care of it. I had my own bank account. I had my own credit card. I had my um, um, my own charge card. You know all of that. Every now and then, I'd say, do you mind balancing my checkbook for me? Um, and he would, but all our bills got paid. I had my bills, my little bills, but all the big bills he took care of. And he was just happy to do it. He was just good with it. He was So good. why blame yourself for that, which you do do in the book? Well, because obviously um, I should have taken a little more interest in our personal finance. So are you saying everybody should do that? Of course they should. Yeah? Yeah. Don't trust? No, trust but verify if I may pardon, if I, pardon me for <laughs> taking from Ronald Reagan. I've been using that phrase a lot lately because it really works. Mm -hmm. you know, I think that it, there's nothing wrong with, because I now run our finances. I have run the books in our household since Howard died. And I, I don't like it any more than I did when um, Howard was alive. And I find myself trying to get my son to not be me. You know, I want my son to recognize that budgets really do matter and you can only spend what you have. And if you spend what you don't have, there are going to be penalties and debt and it makes it worse. And um, this is exactly what we have and this is all we can do and this is how it works. Now that he's 19 and a half, I didn't go through this with him when he was six. So now that you've brought up Spencer, your son. Yeah. This is. Um Quite his story as well. Yeah. So it's did, my co-star. Did, yeah. Did you? Uh, does he? Does he? Is he fine with co-starring in this? D book? Just before it's what they call last pass, which is basically when the manuscript is locked. Yeah. Um, I uh, told him he had to read it, and he did. And I said, if there's anything you want to change or want me to take out, I will. And now's the moment. Um, we can't do it later. Um, but he read the whole thing, and uh, he said. He liked it, he thought it was fine, there wasn't anything he wanted to change. He said, I had no idea you'd been through so much. And he had no idea. Yeah. Really? Oh, well, I guess he was a little boy at the time. A little boy yeah, most yeah, of the yeah, time. Yeah. And I tried not to come home in tears every day if I could help it. And I was in tears a lot. So, but but it, bottom line, is he okay with being portrayed in this story this way? Yeah, I think he compartmentalizes it and it's something different. Because his friends aren't reading Innocent Spouse. It's because it has flowers on the cover. <laughs> um, There's grown-ups on the tell cover. Tell me the story. I, I actually came close to tears as he said goodbye to his dad. Yeah. So I can't read that part because I will go to tears. Tell well, you know, it's ironic that just yesterday I was back at the Washington Hospital Center for another reason. And I wanted to give a copy of the book to Peter Levitt, who was one of the two doctors who, um, who handled Howard's case, who I thought was remarkable. And... Um, I was in the very uh, ICU where Howard died, and I kind of craned my head around, you know, and I looked, there was, there was the room where he died. And you still feel something. Mm -hmm. you, you know, most, mo mo most of grief resolves itself and finds a place to live in you that, that's tolerable and you make peace with it, but it's still always interesting to me how you can have a moment like that and, and it all comes rushing back. And what, but, is, what did Spencer do there when he was a little boy? Well, when I, we'd been there three weeks with Howard on life support and, uh, and then the doctors said that he wasn't, he wasn't gonna make it. And um, so we were gonna pull everything off. Uh, uh, so I said, well, I wanted to bring Spencer in to say goodbye to him because I didn't want him to think his father just disappeared. He was five. He was old enough to, to, to as his father was a real person to him, and you couldn't just have him go out the door and just disappear. I wanted him to see, and he knew that his father was in the hospital being fixed by the doctors, but I, I told him that, that I said, I, have to t I took him out on the canal, the worst days of my life. It was like committing child abuse. And I said, um, I, said I want to talk to you about daddy. And he said, he's, he's, he's gonna die, isn't he? I just, you know, you have a child say that to you, and they're only this tall. And then he, then he just, you know, rammed his head into my stomach and um, tried to be strong. And uh, I said, do you want to go say goodbye to him? And he went, I don't think he knew what that meant, but that was all I needed to hear. So we went to the hospital, and um, it was the day before they were going to unplug him. 
and the, he had wonderful nurses and they made him look nice and they tried to make the room look not scary because it really looked like close encounters of the third kind and there Howard was attached to so many devices. Um, and uh, his male nurse pulled a chair up, lifted Spencer up on it and we were all standing there, two women nurses, me and the male nurse and Spencer said, uh, can I be alone with daddy? And we said, certainly. And uh, we, we backed away and the nurse pulled the curtain. And this, this is an ICU. It's nothing but boingings and noises and buzzes and bells going off. And, but through that curtain, we could hear this little voice singing, you are my sunshine, my only sunshine. You make me happy when skies are gray. And that little voice, and he sang it all the way to the end. We're all sobbing. And then he pulled the curtain and he said, I'm ready to go home. I said goodbye. What, um, still chokes me up, sorry. That what was an incredible what, what had that? What had that song meant to Spencer? He used to go to the Levine School for music classes in the morning. Yeah. Used to be in Georgetown. And uh, his teacher loved to always end every class with, You Are My Sunshine. And you, have, you know, the parents are always sitting around the edges or outside the door. And he'd come running out saying, I, I'd say, what, what is it about that song? He said, it's just too sad. It's about your son going away. I don't want the son to go away. So, so, so he, weird that he would choose he, to sing it. It was a goodbye song. It was a goodbye song. So that's how he knew it. Yeah, yeah. And we've never discussed it again. And we've talked about everything. And we've never discussed you didn't dis it. After he read the book, you didn't discuss that no, scene? No, we haven't that. discussed any specific parts of the book. Except for how gro grossed out he was by me getting kissed by people. <laughs> yeah, we're going we're gonna to get to that because I was a little I grossed out too. You, actually. <laughs> I said thank you, Spencer, for allowing me to have a sex life. Or not. Yeah, I, and I, I'll bet he didn't say you're welcome. No, no. Um, a lot of what you were up against through the period after Howard's death, those couple of years, was mm -hmm. controlling the narrative about you, about your life. What, who were you and what had really happened in that marriage and what did you know and when did you know it and how smart were you and how complicit were you? And the IRS agent, is this a pseudonym in terms of the? the no, the IRS agents are Miriam Fisher and Sheldon Cohen or? No, those are the attorneys, but the IRS oh, oh, agent. Oh, the IRS is Deborah Martin, real person. Okay, so she actually constructed a story of your life to help make her case. She, as, she, as any IRS agent will if they're making a case against you. And you don't have a say so in the narrative. So she wrote a report and you have no say in the narrative mm -mm. and here's how she made you out. She made our very comfortable but comparatively low wattage life sound like high rolling pornography co-starring me and my son. When I wasn't off on a luxurious holiday aboard a private jet or yacht, I was sunbathing by the pool at my estate on the Chesapeake Bay while relying on my domestic staff to attend to my needs. Did she get you right in any way? Are the facts well, it's, at well, least it, you know, it's, it's and, and we in the media do this all the time. Yeah. One, one ride on a Learjet becomes jets. The occasional charter of kind of nice, funky sailboats becomes yachts. Yes, we did have a five-acre spread on the Chesapeake Bay. It was, it was wonderful. I, I suppose you would call it an estate, but that's such a rich word. But, but it, it becomes tumescent. And it's, it's, you don't see it that way, but then one, one of the things, I, one of the lessons I've learned through these 14 years is to respect the way other people see you. You have to, you have to respect that because perception is everything. And if you don't like the way people are seeing you, you have to, you have to do something about it. But, but they have a right to see you that way. She had a right to see me that way. She didn't ever come out there. She didn't meet me. She didn't know my life, you know? Um, but it was... So seeing yourself written up. It was fair enough, but it wasn't accurate, you know? But it was fair, enough, enough. What do you mean? Well, in that, think of any one of you, if, if all of a sudden an IRS agent came in and evaluated your life. They're evaluating it from their point of view of perceiving you as using ill-gotten gains. And it's in their best interest to make their case to show that these ill-gotten gains are producing a lifestyle you might not otherwise have. So it, get, it becomes colorful. 
So when, when you read this account of yourself as a sort of Cruella de Vil of Chesapeake Bay, did, did, did or you, Paris did, Hilton? Did, did, yeah, more appropriately, <laughs> much better. Did you ha did you have uh, did you have any any recourse? I mean, did did you get to talk back to that report? Well, I burst into tears, but then yeah, I mean, when I got my new lawyers, um, we got rational about it. I mean, I will say to the credit of Deborah Martin and the IRS in general, when when I fired the lawyers I inherited and got my new lawyers, she stood down. She backed away. She she retreated and let my new lawyers make a new case, a new defense that was of me, not of Howard. And, and the narrative changed, and it became more realistic. I mean, because I, I, you know, my life was an open book, but I wanted it to be the correct open book. We did own a house out on the bay. We did have boats. We did have cars. You know, they weren't going to be mine anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, I was having to sell everything. Every so what, what, should, what would have been a couple of sentences that would have put all of that narrative in perspective? That it was a house that, that none of it was real. These things may have existed, but they weren't, they weren't really ours, I found out. Yeah. You know, they, they, they were more Deborah's than mine. And I just had to try to hold on to as much as I could hold on to because it was all going away. I mean, I was on a sinkhole trying to hold on to my son and, and not go down. And I, you know what? I didn't mind if, if, we, could, if we could survive. I would part with as much as I had to, just to stay afloat. I saw so much of what we had as just ballast, and I had to get it dealt with. So there's that narrative constructed yes. by Deborah Martin. And then, in order to establish that you didn't know what was going on to, to, get, to be granted the status of innocent spouse, which would get you out which from Which is not an easy thing to get. Yeah. This is not uh, granted handily by the IRS. You have to, you have to produce a formidable defense. So the defense was, in part, the construction of another story about you. Miriam Cohen presents Mary you. Miriam Fisher. Miriam Fisher, sorry. Presents you with a, a written version of your story that's almost mm -hmm. the exact opposite of what the IRS agent had written. And uh, this you actually quote from. Well, first you, you preface it by saying, the report showed the truth, and the truth made me cringe. I was too trusting, sheltered would be the word, idiotic seemed more like it, even stupid. Mm -hmm. And then you actually quote from what she wrote, and it was this, throughout her career and her adult life, Carol steadfastly avoided getting involved in financial matters because she knew they were complex and she did not understand them. She would hire professionals or defer to her father or husband. Carol was enticed and overwhelmed by Howard's ability to make decisions and get the job done, and his obvious comfort in a good life that she had never before experienced. For a girl who had worked since high school and who furnished her apartment with camping equipment, this was an exciting and exotic new world. And it, so it comes close to, to, your defense came close to needing to declare that you were kind of a bimbo. Well, idiot, I think. Idiot, okay. Yeah, I just didn't have the bimbo thing going on, right. you know, but um, as a new mother with short hair and kind of baggy clothes, but, but I was an idiot. I was ignorant. I, I often say the IRS calls it innocent spouse, but it could have been ignorant spouse because that's really what I was and I chose to be. And, um, and, and Miriam's defense was very straight on. Now you should, do, do you want to talk about some of the other things that she used to defend me were really the nitty gritty of my defense? In terms of the ways that Howard well, deceived you? Yeah, the why, why. Sure, let's talk I, about it. The things that, that that's, Howard, that. You, that's that, where I won. Yeah, all right. It wasn't, in, you know, yes, I was. Uh, Howard had told, fed you all manner of a, false facts about his life, where he'd little, gone to school. and these strange little revisions of his personal narrative. He told me he'd gone to Harvard, but he'd gone to the University of Pennsylvania. I don't really see the difference. It wouldn't be the kind of thing that would make me go, well, then that's the end of our love affair. <laughs> you know? He told me that he'd been married to a Russian princess. And I remember when Martha saw that, my sister-in-law, she said that was only in her mind. And uh, he told me that I was wife number three, but I was actually wife number four. He told me that he'd graduated from Choate. Well, he'd gone to Choate and got kicked out and graduated from St. Stephen's. Again, these aren't deal breakers. The only, the only little fudging of the truth that would have actually mattered to me was, and this was his subterfuge, after his father died, um, he had, uh, there was a trust and he got a payment from the trust. He told me the payment was like $20,000 a month. 
Well, that would explain some of the pad we had, mm -hmm. you know, that, uh, you know, it's not like we were living outrageously better, but better. And, um, and uh, but it was really only about $15,000 every three months. So that's, that's a big difference. So those were the facts. When those were presented to the IRS, they truly bought that you had been duped. Well, also, very importantly, I had never worked a day of my life in Nathan's or any restaurant. I'd never in my life handled bookkeeping. I'd never in my life taken econ economics. My entire life had been in journalism and news. I'd always had my own career. These are the kinds of things where the IRS very critically makes a determination on, on innocent spouse. They really look to see if the spouse, male or female, was involved in a, the, the spouse's business, and B, knew that the ill-gotten gains were ill-gotten gains. So I'm fascinated in all of this to get to this point where you're, where you're willing to put into a deposition or some sort of mm -hmm. legal brief these facts about your husband lying to you. Mm -hmm. That you needed those facts. You needed to prove he that he was a liar. He was defending me from the grave. By virtue of you proving that he had misled you and deceived you. Most of these things came to me from others. It yeah. was really his sister, Martha, who read the defense as it was first written and went, this isn't true. This isn't true. Where'd you get this? This isn't true. And you true. were delighted to hear these things at this point. Oh, you needed the God. ammunition. The moment where she told me that I was wife number four and wife number three, I wanted to kiss her. <laughs> I mean, it was, we were leaving the lawyer's offices where she just told them all the things that were wrong and needed to be made right. And we were standing at the elevators, and she was very glum. And the elevator went ping, and we started to get in, and she said, there was something else I didn't tell you. And I said, what? She said, well, I don't want to hurt your feelings. I said, Martha, get serious. I said, what? And she said, well, you weren't wife number four. You weren't wife number three. You were wife number four. I went, oh my god, that's fantastic. I pushed the elevator door back open, grabbed her, went running back into Morgan Lewis, shouting, Miriam, Miriam, where are you? Another lie. So let me ask you about... A good one. Uh, well, there were some great lies at that point. I want to ask you, though, about earlier in, your, in, 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 in the process of you being disillusioned, and I mean that word very literally, about who Howard was. Right. How did you digest, or how long did you resist reassessing I mean, taking who, who an axe really to his was. gravestone? Yeah. <laughs> you say, each new truth moved me a greater distance from the man I loved. The more Howard came into focus, the less he was the man I knew. Well, I had this love for this man I thought I was married to, and that was a very real and profound love. And then I was shaping this different love for the man I was finding out that he was, and that was not unlike the love you have for a, 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 a wayward sibling or a, a child who just keeps getting in trouble and you're pulling your hair out. You love them. But it's not this ebullient, you know, um, uh, cheerleading kind of love. It's more a patient, frustrated kind of love. But what was interesting that happened is that, you know, I settled with the IRS. And then I was stuck with Nathan's. And I had no idea what I was getting into. And that was just, that was the, that was the journey into hell. And, uh, and it was, you know, how they talked about with, uh, LBJ in Vietnam getting deeper into the Big Muddy. Well, owning Nathan's was like that for me. I just kept getting deeper and deeper and deeper in until I was practically up to here. And, and, it, and that really, really stirred my anger. And I realized that's where my anger was toward Howard. Mm -hmm. not, not as much the IRS thing because that got fixed and that, that, that was dismaying. That was dismaying, but I was sort of as mad at myself as I was at him. But the Nathan's thing was where I really got angry. And I didn't know what to do with it because it's very hard to get angry at a dead person, short of taking the ax to the gravestone. And um, I'd find myself transferring it to my son, especially as he got older. If, uh, if Spencer told me a little fib or a little lie, I would think this was the beginning of, you know, epidemic uh, failure to tell the truth. So and do you, in the end, as you, as you accepted that uh Howard was not the man you thought you knew. Do you think you ever really knew him? I think I knew a lot of him, but I did. I think I actually I know him better now than I knew him then, and I do know him now. And I and I I, I have a lot of uh, tenderness. And uh, you would have married him. 
knowing all of this? You know, I, had he told me about it when we were married, I would have helped fix it. And we would have stayed married, but he didn't give me that option by not telling me. Um, would I, if he came, I, I have this dream, I don't really have it as much anymore. I used to have this dream where he'd come back and take me out to dinner, and like I'd throw him the keys and say, you know, you drive. And then I would tell him all the things I've done without him, <laughs> you know. And uh, it wasn't so much that I was punching him in the nose as in these dreams I was saying, look, I, I, I've done this, I've done this, I've done this, I've done this, I've even fixed the plumbing, I've done this, I've done this, and I've done this. So it was like my, my anger was more like, see, I could have done this. As, and, as, you could have shared this with me. As chapter 31 opens, I didn't ever want to be sheltered, pampered. I didn't ever again want to be the sheltered, pampered, and indulged woman who didn't know what a mortgage was or what escrow meant or whether right. her husband paid taxes. That woman was gone. Now I paid the bills. I decided where and how the money would go. I did the driving, and I paid the taxes. So... That's you. Well, that's life. I mean, but that's who we all should be in our lives. We should, we should be that in full. We should, maybe we share it with another person if we're married, but we, it should be an equal load. And if, if one all of a sudden can't do it, the other one can't. But wasn't, wasn't life a whole lot easier when you didn't know any of this and well, you thought he was taking care of it? Life, wasn't it great? It wasn't real. Uh -huh. And look how much I had to pay. You know, for 14 years I was paying for it. I mean, I got that, that heap of misery at the corner, which I loved as a customer, but as, but as an owner, it was never anything but a noose around my neck. No, but I'm talking about the period before everything went wrong, while Howard was well, still alive. Well, yeah, it was alive. great, but, but, but John, I'm all grown up now, and I see it. Do you like this better? Uh, you like being grown up is really important. Uh, let me tell you, nothing beats having some money, but I like this better. I'd like to have this and some money. <laughs> So there's a lot of talk about dating. Yes. Um, it's important. You went through a period when you said uh, you, people couldn't find a place for you at dinner parties. I was invariably seated between the priest and the gay man. <laughs> Nothing against either, but it just doesn't make for a hot night. You know, I, I have Washington is all about never putting a, a mildly attractive woman anywhere near uh, a married man between the ages of about 35 and 65. They just won't do it. I'm dying to find a line that I marked here, but I've missed it. It'll come to the you. The love scenes. Well, I was going to quote from it because... Pretty, pretty hot one? I was going to kind of cringe. Um, Aww. Not that, they're, not that they're badly done. They're actually quite tastefully done, but I just find it, in terms of self-exposure, sitting across from you here, but the I lines actually, about my fingers crawled up his chest and well, I wanted to do. dive into him. <laughs> so, you do when it's so, good. so why I, what, is this to help sell the book to the chicks or I actually toned it down. <laughs> I'm sure I'm sure you did. No. No, because somebody was saying, Well, is that is that a that's a kiss and tell? And I said it's literally a kiss and tell because I don't write about anybody in there I had sex with except my husband. I kept all the people I had sex with out of the book, and those are just people I kissed. In some cases, I That's might a have great won. standard. I, 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 <laughs> so it is, it is a kiss. That, I, I would have liked it to have maybe gone a little farther, but, uh, but you know the most important thing is, is, is being is, as a widow, and, and you've lost this person you've been with for 20 years, and you, you think you'll never get kissed again, and then getting kissed again, that's it's pretty, it's good, it's important. Because you, you know, kind of, it lights your pilot light. And you realize, I'm still a woman, I'm alive, there is a world. Uh, it was very important for me to feel that, especially since at the same time, I was a saloon owner and a, and a tax fraud defendant and trying to hold on to my job at CNN and a solo parent. Mm -hmm. And it was so nice to have somebody just want to kiss me. Sure. You know, kisses yeah. are good. Desire is good. I think the most honest thing of every, all of the honest things you say in this book you correct something that you said the last time you were interviewed about your life. Uh, Dave Statter uh, mm -hmm. did an interview with you in this right, setting, right for the and he asked you, "Did you love? Do, do you love Howard?" And or uh, if you missed Howard, and you said, "Sure, I do every day." And in this book, you say, "Actually, dang, you know that sounds great, but maybe it's not really the truth." And you yeah. say, "I missed Howard less and less. I could yeah. no longer instantly recall the sound of his voice. I visited his grave less often." 
Spencer and I talked about him, of course, but whole weeks would, pa would pass without mention of his name. Along with missing him less, I was processing the anger more, but it was muddled up with regret, remorse, and disappointment. He never meant to leave Spencer and me with a life of turmoil, debt, and uncertainty, but regardless, that's exactly what he did do. So I like that you're not doing the sweet, perfect answer that he's still in the room and you're thinking about him. He's kind of, he, you, he, but you've let go. For, I would huh? say that for any widow, divorcee, even if there were no shenanigans, you, you just eventually have to move on. It doesn't mean that you don't love somebody and that they weren't terribly important to you, but you just can't go through life and love, having your love box all filled up. It's gotta be a little room for somebody else to move in. And your closing words for the entire book, Howard, wherever you are, no one else may get this, but I know you understand. Now we move on. Mm -hmm. He would understand. He'd get it. He'd, he'd get what, though? Why I wrote it and uh, what Why? I tried to achieve. Why did you write it? Uh, a good story. I'm a storyteller, and uh, my whole life I've been doing other people's stories, but this was a good story. It was in me. It needed to come out. I thought it might resonate with some people going through the same thing or similar. Um, and uh, it, it just, it, I... I've always felt I had no choice. But books end with a, with a finality, with a finale. There's a last chapter, you have those last words, you close the that book, is the chapter's end. over. It is. It, it's, it's an ending. Is it that is, part it, ended? Yeah, it's life? made my life very scary now, because I've stepped off that island, you know? I've, I'm back at dry land. All I ever wanted to do is get back to dry land. You know, I, I, you know, I use the analogy of uh, Castaway in the book, yeah. the Tom Hanks film and that I was on that island with Wilson and I built my life raft and I got back to dry land and I feel very much like Tom Hanks at the end of that film where he's standing at a dusty crossroads and he doesn't know which way he's going and then the movie ends and I so wish they'd show me which way to go. I, I just don't know what's next. So it's, it's I'm, I'm, I have that scaredness that you have when you're you know, just starting out on a journey. We'll see what the next chapter is. We're out of time. Yes, I'm Thanks optimistic. Very much. You've been wonderful. So have you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.